Babs, welcome to the Easy Conversation podcast. Thank you for joining me this morning. Um, really excited about the conversation we're going to have. We had the opportunity to connect prior to today, and I've been able to get an understanding of some of the work you're doing. And what I really appreciated was the alignment around how we see self-help and how it's become a bit of a trend, which is good in a way, but then also it loses its meaning at times. So uh, I'm sure we'll get into that. But before we do, I do want to give you an opportunity to share with the listeners a little bit about yourself, what's brought you here, and what it is that you're doing. Good morning, and thank you for having me. And thank you to your listeners for tuning in wherever they might be in the world. It's always exciting to come together in a shared space with Mm like-minded individuals. I've always been a firm believer there are no strangers. There are simply parts of our soul we have yet to be reunited with. And so Mm -hmm. thank you again for having me today. And I also look forward to our conversation after our our initial conversation. I am, I'm Amy Lane Carroll. My friends and those people who know me and love me call me Babs. And it's short for Badass Butterfly. And it's a name I've earned and loved and cherished and, and hold close to my heart. It signifies my spiritual growth and my spiritual journey mm. along the way. And I am a spiritual transformation coach. I work with individuals who may have had a traumatic <clears throat> church upbringing or religious upbringing. Mm. I also work with individuals who have been incarcerated for long periods of time and are looking for re- parole release within the next 18 to 24 months. There's lots of things that that go on in life. And for me, everything has a spiritual foundation to it. And I know we're going to talk a little bit more mm-hmm. about that. So with that, yes. I'm looking yes. forward to the conversation as it comes about. The easy conversation, mind you. Yeah, hopefully it's easy. <laughs> there mostly are easy conversations, but it depends on whether or not it's an easy listen. You touched on some of that traumatic religious experience, and I do want to dive into that. But just before we get there, I do want to understand for yourself, what was that transformation like for you? And, and you talked about the the badass butterfly, and I've often reflected on the transformation a caterpillar goes through to become a butterfly, and it's uh, often something we all tend to avoid, uh, the painful growth period, and we don't (laughs) see going to emerge, obviously. Um, So I've often thought about that and reflected and and even shared with others. You think about the journey the caterpillar has to go through and the cocooning process that uh, we can all look at for ourselves. So what was it like for you in terms of that transformation and then why the butterfly? I'd like to say it was really easy, but it wasn't. It has been the absolute hardest thing I have ever done. And it's absolutely the best thing I have ever done. My, the true transformation really started back in 2007. It was the first expiration date I was given by a medical professional. Cancer mm. diagnosis, wasn't responding to the treatment. And they gave me six weeks. And that was back in 2007. I did what most people do when you receive news and information like that. I went home and I cried. (laughs) I cried like a baby. Mm -hmm. It was really hard to balance that in my thought. I'd always been a a survivor. I had always been Mm -hmm. a rule follower. I had always been what I thought everyone else wanted me to be. And that was the key. I had spent the first 35 years of my life focusing on what I thought everyone around me wanted me to be or needed me to be in order for them to be happy with me. That's where I would Mm -hmm. get my value and my worth. And so when you receive information and news like that, it's startling. And what I'm learning is that's not a bad thing. It was an invitation. And what I did with that invitation is I began questioning absolutely everything I thought Mm -hmm. I believed. And through that process, what I learned was that I really didn't believe a whole lot. I had a Mm -hmm. whole lot of borrowed belief. And whether it was my parents or siblings or teachers or bosses, whatever, all shared with good intention, my belief system 
was a structure of borrowed beliefs. And so when it Mm -hmm. came time to really figure out who and what I was and why I was even here, I first had to realize I had no blooming idea what I really believed. And if you don't know what you Mm. believe and you don't know why you're here, then there's no way to find happiness. And when I talk Mm -hmm. about happiness, I'm talking about being satisfied and fulfilled and feeling like you've got a purpose. And yes, you may go to bed at night exhausted, but it's a fulfilled exhausted, not an overwhelmed Mm -hmm. exhausted. And so that Mm -hmm. transformation for me, it, it's been a journey since 2007. But what Mm. I, the commitment I made was to find me and Mm. not to necessarily throw out the previous 35 years, but I think so many of your listeners uh, have probably heard of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, and he always talks Mm -hmm. about finding the helpers in Mm -hmm. a moment of crisis or in a moment of challenge, look for the helpers. For me, what I was looking for, what I learned to look for was to look for the good, even in the Mm -hmm. midst of a diagnosis that would seem, or a prognosis that would seem to have an end date to it that I didn't have control over. And what Mm -hmm. I learned was, is I have a whole lot more command over my experience. And command Mm -hmm. is bringing in the people who can help me better understand what is going on whether it be physical, mental, health, spiritual, religion, any of it, versus Mm -hmm. thinking that I have to know everything about everything and therefore be a control freak. Yeah. So when you make that transition from control to command, you begin to see that the two facts about butterflies, I love the idea of for me, butterflies are instrumental in my life because Mm -hmm. there's two facts that I'll share with you that so resonate with life that when we take the time to really think about these two facts, scientific facts, it helps us put a new perspective on whatever it is we might be facing. And the first Mm -hmm. fact is that the butterfly and the caterpillar is the only creature known scientifically to completely 100% change its DNA from its birth to its death. So that caterpillar in the cocoon, it's not taking a nap. Mm. It is actually transforming. It is the most active that creature will ever be, completely transforming its DNA from a caterpillar into now a butterfly. So this Mm -hmm. idea that transformation is supposed to be easy or we're meant to be dormant or that things hard, that's the only way for things to transform is really a misunderstanding of what transformation is because Mm -hmm. caterpillars are born to become butterflies. And it's without that cocooning stage, without that chrysalis, without that overwhelming transformation from something A into something B, But we we would not enjoy the beauty of a butterfly. And so it it helps me to think about in those challenging moments, whether it be mental, physical, whatever, to think about where's the good in this. And so I'm focusing on the positive as opposed to the hardship. Mm -hmm. And then we take that hardship. The second fact I'll share with you is, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, But it has been proven that a butterfly with up to 70% of its wings damaged or missing can defy gravity and take flight. And so often as a human being, we think that if we have one ailment or another or one disability or one otherwise abled capability in our life, that there's something wrong with us. And so therefore, until we have that fixed, We don't Mm -hmm. have anything of value to offer the world. And so we isolate. And the Mm -hmm. truth of the matter is is that if we were to share that transformative journey with those closest to us, one, I don't know about you, but every journey I've gone on is always better with a travel partner. And two, Mm -hmm. you just might be the inspiration to someone else 
to show up for themselves that day, even if they're feeling less than their ideal person. So transformation mm -hmm. to me has been a gift. And that first mm -hmm. expiration date, I have learned to come to see as an invitation as opposed to a verdict or an indictment and to recognize it was just an opinion. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing all that. And if I'm not mistaken, I read or heard somewhere that every butterfly is, is I think you touched on the DNA piece, but that DNA is so unique to that butterfly. So it can't be replicated. And I think, again, if we were to look at the comparison with humans, I think as part of our transformations, we will become an individual that is unique in our own way. Often it's tough where people will get lost in the comparison that, oh, my healing or my transformation isn't happening as quickly as I'd like, or it's not happening like this person who I know or I can see, but who you're becoming is very unique to yourself. So you have to let that process unfold as hard as it may be, but also be grateful for the individual you're become, becoming because there's no one else like you. Exactly. And when you view it in that way, you have so much more gratitude for your own individual unique journey and the transformation you're going through. The other piece you touched on, I wanted to also expand on was the idea of helpers, right? So we will have helpers along the way, but what I've come to realize is you have to be open and willing to receive the help as well. And so many people I work with, as they're going through that process, they are often making that connection that this is a helper and maybe I should be in a different place. And that's okay. That's part of their journey. But being aware of that too, that, hey, maybe I can receive some help right now. And often when we're going through these experiences, we're so closed off that we're not able to receive. I don't know if you have any thoughts around that, but I just wanted to put that out there as well. I, absolutely. And I actually think both of those ideas are actually intertwined. The idea mm -hmm. that, you know, I used to think that I was becoming or I was mm -hmm. awakening to something. And what I'm learning is that mm -hmm. not unlike the butterfly, I'm not changing. I'm simply becoming who I was intended to be all along. A caterpillar's purpose is to become a butterfly. And yes, there are day-to-day -day activities that happen while the caterpillar is a caterpillar. But then that, that next stage, that next phase, mm -hmm. that unfoldment within the cocoon is not changing because there was something wrong with the caterpillar. It's a change. It's a transformation because that caterpillar is becoming what it was meant to be all along. So it's not that we're changing something and that we're eliminating. It's that we're actually removing the barriers to be, to realizing who we've been all along, just didn't realize it mm -hmm. or forgot mm -hmm. along the way. And that process really does require us. And that, that to me is a big word. Require mm -hmm. is a big word because it holds us accountable. And what it mm -hmm. requires of us is to learn the difference between control and command. Mm -hmm. Control says, I'm changing because I don't like who I am and therefore I need to figure out who, I'm, who I am and be mm -hmm. that person. Mm -hmm. Command says, I know that regardless of the spiritual text or the universal philosophy that I may ad adhere to or study or consider myself a student of, each of those different texts, the origin, our origin, we were each made perfect, whole, and complete. Yes. And if that perfect, whole, and complete is the caterpillar, then the butterfly is the actual realization of that. And what I get to do on a day-to-day -day basis is I, I get to look for that wholeness. I get to look for that perfection, not human perfection, 
but universe perfection, divine perfection, I get to look for the completeness. And that's the looking for the good. That's the looking for the helpers. And in that idea that you shared of receiving, talking about that idea of receiving support goes mm -hmm. back to something else that you said a moment ago. It's the comparison. Mm -hmm. To me, the enemy of healing, there is only one. And it is comparison. Because when we compare ourselves, mm -hmm. whether it's to our impression of who we should be, someone else's agenda of who they think we are, some morphed idea that society puts upon us, that is a comparison. And as mm -hmm. opposed to learning to love ourselves exactly where we're at, because when we learn to love ourselves exactly where we're at, we see the good, we see the perfection, we see the wholeness, we see the completeness. And then we can begin to shed those behaviors, those activities that aren't serving us any longer. Mm -hmm. Look, habits, behaviors, activities, we do them because they serve us. There's a payout paycheck that we get from it. Emotional, spiritual, physical, doesn't matter what it is. But when we are able to admit, when we're able to see that a behavior, an activity, a belief no longer serves us, and we're able to let go of that, mm -hmm. then that wholeness, that perfection, that completeness shines through. And that we think, to me, that's the change. We're taking those layers off. But the, yeah. what we're doing is removing those opinions. We're removing those comparisons that we have accepted. So we're really quick to accept the critique around us. Mm -hmm. What we get to do is work to be really good at accepting the help and the good that exists around us, even in the midst of challenge. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. Comparison is the thief of joy. And we often get, yeah. And I also look at it in terms of, as you were talking about the layers, it's almost like I've come to understand and it's been explained to me as well is we end up also putting these veils over our heart so we're not able to have that open heart and feel and there's so much blockage between us and the the universal experience we're supposed to have but that happens through these transformations as you've touched on the other piece as you were talking about there reminded me of last year i was on a hike as in this meditative state and i was thinking about my journey and I had been resisting for so long all these transformations I was that were happening for me. And obviously I've had to reframe that they were happening for me. And I had this deep inner realization that and I was closing my eyes and I just saw a reflection of myself, the individual who had become. And in that moment I had this deep sense of gratitude because all and it was for me a moment to be grateful towards god for me at least and it was a reflection that you know everything i had gone through i was being shaped into this individual of now i had become and i think that was something i really uh, that's really stuck with me because we often lose sight of that and we resist and we fight back but in that moment just letting it all go and feel it and see that reflection as i close my eyes was profound, at least for me in that moment. But it's definitely something that stuck with me. And it, I just remembered and recalled it as you were sharing that. Yeah. It, I love that idea of the reframing mm -hmm. and taking the time. It's such an important step that so many of us have neglected because we're not invited into that space of reframing. We are accustomed to someone sharing an idea and oftentimes, depending upon who that person is in our experience, we take that as gospel. Mm -hmm. No ill will meant using the, that phraseology there. But that idea of reframing mm -hmm. is to me, and it comes back to that perfect whole and complete. And also takes me back to, again, regardless of the, the spiritual text that you that resonates most with you. Mm -hmm. Each of those spiritual texts teach us about the idea of oneness. Mm -hmm. And 
oneness, if we believe that, if we experience that, if we are striving to better live from that place, we will sooner or later come to the understanding that the word two versus four is really important. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by that? It's like you said, it was happening. It wasn't happening to me. It was happening for me. Mm -hmm. To me denotes that I'm separate from my creator, my source, right. the universe, God, divine mind and a divine mm -hmm. idea. Four is an acknowledgement that I am but the expression of divine mind. Mm -hmm. And without me living authentically, without you living authentically, divine idea, divine mind, God, source, creator, spirit, pick a word, I don't care, whatever resonates with you, without us living from our authentic place, that origin is not fully expressed because we are but a part of the oneness being expressed. Each of us unique, as you pointed out a moment ago, but it's incomplete expression mm -hmm. if we are living someone else's agenda, mm -hmm. someone else's expectation of us. Yeah. Because that's not what God intended. Mm -hmm. God intended for us to be the expression of God, the expression of the divine mind. And just like the sun doesn't shine without rays, some of them reach further than others. But each has its purpose and each has its place and each is a cherished part. And without it, the sun isn't fully expressed. Mm -hmm. Same as, in my opinion, in my experience, same as our relationship with God, source, mm -hmm. creator, universe. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And just coming back to something else you mentioned around, and, and I agree with you, but I do want to talk about this dichotomy that exists because there's this idea of we are perfect as we are and that's where I agree with you but then there's the other side that we are also flawed because that's where the humility comes in that we can continue to improve and we don't have all the answers but people then tend to fall into that and perhaps that's where they may struggle is if I'm flawed then how can I be perfect and I think for me there's a level of acceptance around, okay, I am, and that's a daily <laughs> battle. Oh, <not> I am, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I am perfect as I am, but I still don't have all the answers and I'm still going to make mistakes and that's okay. How can I learn from those? Where do you find like how, or how are you able to help people find that balance within that dichotomy? Because I think you could see how people can struggle with the latter. Absolutely. And I think it's the lens through which we are looking at whatever situation mm -hmm. we are looking at. Mm -hmm. If we are looking at that, if we are looking through the lens of the human eye and we are striving for human perfection, mm -hmm. we will fail 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. I'll use myself as an example. Growing up, I was a rule follower. I did what I was told. I ate healthy. I mean, when you're 22 years old and you get your first cancer diagnosis and you're a vegetarian who's running marathons and doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, like where's the perfection in that? Mm. Where's the grace in that? That was my perfect journey from a spiritual perspective because I am learning the lessons that I need to learn to be, to remove those layers to transform within the cocoon, to see my true being, to see my true essence and my true purpose. So I think the first thing is for me, when, I'm, when I get caught up in that comparison world, uh, I made perfect, whole and complete, but if that were true, I should be able to get up and walk across the room. I can't. I'm not physically able to do that at this time. So that then takes us then to asking, okay, then what is perfection? What is this perfection or this wholeness or this completeness we're talking about? And for me, that's di divine mind, divine idea, God. And our spiritual texts tell us that we were created in the image and likeness of God. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we were created for the good, to express that good in God. And look, 
we may not be very skilled at that. I don't know about you, but when I was in the first grade, I wasn't doing algebra. Yeah. And I sure wasn't doing trigonometry and physics was totally out of the question. So there's this learning ground that mm -hmm. we each are a part of. And that learning ground is taking us from this human experience and mm -hmm. human definitions to really, pull, again, we're talking about pulling back layers here yep. and borrowed ideas, borrowed beliefs, and really determining what something means to me. What is life? Mm -hmm. To me, life used to be you get up every day at five o'clock. You've got these activities you're doing. The, it's, it was all about activity and movement. And when your world comes to what felt like a screeching halt after a stroke and you're a quadriplegic and you're a doer, you take a few minutes, mm -hmm. you cry your tears and you feel that feeling because without feeling that feeling, you don't get the invitation then to then translate that back into what, do, what is divine mind seeing? What lens am I looking through when I think about my life? I don't believe that God gives us challenges to prove our dedication, our worth, our value. I think mm -hmm. I believe and my experience has been that life unfolds. And we get to choose our level of engagement. Mm -hmm. And as we begin to choose our level of engagement, our skill level increases in being able to discern what's really going on. I had an epiphany moment after meditation. Meditation is really important in my world. Meditation, prayer, contemplation. Mm -hmm. And... Shortly after my stroke, again, leaving me a complete quadriplegic from the neck down, having been an intellectual academic earlier in my life, huge fan of Stephen Hawking. And if you know anything about Stephen Hawking, his body, by so many definitions, would people would say had betrayed him. I was feeling, I was feeling like my body is betraying me. I've got all of these things that I'm doing that I can't do any longer. Mm -hmm. Would I say that Stephen Hawking's had absolutely nothing to give to the world because his body didn't work the way everybody else's did? Mm -hmm. And to say that out loud, you actually laugh. It's yeah. ludicrous. So it's that what is the lens that we are looking through when we are seeing what our experience is? And hey, look through that human lens. It's important to have that human perspective. But don't stop there. Ask that question, whether it's in prayer or meditation or contemplation or whatever your spiritual practice is, take that question. What does the divine mind see mm. when he looks at my life or she looks at my life? Take it to the next level and be open to receiving the answer. Mm -hmm. because me coming to terms with the fact that my body wouldn't do what I would wanted it to do was a big challenge for me. Mm -hmm. I had been a doer and that's what people expected of me right. or so I thought. Mm -hmm. And what I learned was that it wasn't about the doing. It was about me showing up and being present. And mm -hmm. that is what people expected of me. Mm -hmm. And that's an okay expectation for yeah. me to show up and be present. Mm -hmm. So that difference in perfection, when we talk about, I'm a flawed, I'm a flawed human being. Absolutely, every one of us are. But that's because our skill level in seeing divine mind playing out in our experience, our skill level is mm -hmm. at different places. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you, but my skill level today is different than my skill level tomorrow and different than my skill level yesterday. And it isn't always in an upward trajectory. Yeah. So it's just being calm and taking mm -hmm. a deep breath and saying, you know what? I'm here. I've got this. I don't have to do it alone. Look for a helper. But butterfly with 70% of its wings, 
clipped or or broken can still take flight mm. and that is that divine idea of movement of motion of transformation mm -hmm. and it gives us a perspective to look at our own experiences one with a res with more reception receptivity sorry but two that new perspective and that new lens is actually an invitation not only for us but for those around us to mm -hmm. see their experiences differently as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I, I agree. And, and what I'm hearing from you there is really finding that meaning in your experience. And that's where a lot of that acceptance can come in too, where you're able to connect to that meaning. The other piece I did want to come back to, because you've touched on it a couple of times and it ties into the work you're doing around borrowed beliefs and mm -hmm. religious trauma that often people experience. And I see this quite a bit. I had my own form of it. It wasn't as, I would say, as drastic as other people. But again, that's me just trying to compare. Uh, but I got, went through it. And I think a lot of the times when I'm talking to people, whether it's clients or friends, the trauma is often associated with how other people have acted in the name of faith yes. and and then we tend to just throw the baby out with the bathwater, saying oh, well the faith is flawed because that's why people behave this way and i struggle with that because when for me i was of the same mindset for a period of time but the deeper i explored and the more i for myself went on this journey of pursuing the truth i've been able to see the beauty behind it rather than the choices people make because i've also made poor choices and that should not be a reflection of my faith um, so i think when you get into that deeper understanding and ultimately when you're able to have this connection with the divine or whatever people may want to call it for me it's god you tend to realize that is the most purest connection you can experience and then all of that noise tends to go away. So again, reflecting on this idea of borrowed beliefs and some of the trauma people experience from whether it's faith or other experiences they may have had early in life, how are you able to help people navigate that and work through that trauma and finally build a connection that they are secure in and all of that pain tends to dissipate over time. Sure. I think for me, the biggest thing is, it, and again, this is one of those, I, I call them angel whispers or God whispers in that quiet mm -hmm. moment when you've really just been struggling with something. And some people might call it an aha moment, but is, <clears throat> I think so often we think about this idea of a crisis of faith. And that's an easy label to put on because we think of our religion as our faith. Mm -hmm. And what I'm learning is, and what I can see so clearly in my own experience, is that what people are experiencing more often than not is not a crisis of faith, but a crisis mm -hmm. of belief. Mm -hmm. Because we believe that something should unfold a certain way or we believe that someone should act a certain way, ourselves and others included. Mm -hmm. And so what we're doing is we're operating on the spectrum of belief, but we're calling it faith. Yeah. And the reality of it is those are two very different things. Because if I don't know, one, what I believe and why I believe it, and we can't really believe something until we've experienced it, and it's during that experience that faith actually comes out and shows itself is mm -hmm. in the midst of a challenge, a trauma, a, a, a hardship, whatever, however you want to define it. And so this idea of being raised in being raised with one belief pattern mm -hmm. and whether that's spiritual, religion, morally, culturally, whatever it is is really taking a look and saying, do I really believe these things? Do I believe 
that there are only a few people that are chosen to go to heaven and the rest of us are going to hell. No, that was a borrowed belief. That's what I was taught. And there's a difference between a belief and a teaching. And that's why it's so important not to go back and memorize our spiritual texts, mm -hmm. but to, I, for me, I don't, I, to me, I just let's take the Bible for an example. Yeah. I think of the Bible as a love letter from God to man. I think of the Bible as man trying to work out his and her relationship to God. And if you need an example of that, take the God of the Old Testament and compare him to God of the New Testament. Two completely different beings and entities as far as compassion and love versus vengeance and judgment. God didn't change. God is immutable. What changed mm -hmm. was man's understanding of God mm -hmm. and God's role in man's experience. And so that divine idea, that divine revelation, that divine inspiration that brings us our spiritual texts are still tainted by the human experience that was receiving those ideas, those revelations that then turned them into a written idea that we can go back and look. So for me, it's that idea of in my world, whether someone's coming to me because of past religious trauma or whether they're coming to me because they've got a challenge in their marriage or their work is it's everything that I, everyone that I work with, we have a spiritual foundation to our dialogue because I believe we are spiritual beings having a human experience. Mm -hmm. And so the very first thing I encourage people to do is go back to whatever your scriptural text is, your spiritual text, and reread the stories as if you've never read them before. Read them from this perspective, not of there's a lesson here to be learned, but that there's an idea here that will carry me through the challenge that's sitting in front of me. There, I'm a student of Christian science. And mm -hmm. Christian science is where I came to understand my perfection, my wholeness, and my completeness, just in the idea of my very existence. Now, when we take that idea of the Bible as a literal text versus an inspired word of God, it changes our belief patterns. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important that we ask ourselves the hard questions. And when you're asking yourself the hard questions, I'm going to go back to something I said earlier, look for the helpers. Mm -hmm. And you're not looking to someone to give you an answer. But one of the things that I so admire about the Jewish faith, especially uh, early, early days, is they had an activity called Midrash, mm -hmm. where the rabbis would all get together and they might just take a single passage, a single sentence in the Bible and they would talk about it and they would pull it out and they would explore it and they would turn it over and kick it and they would argue about it and debate about it. But they talked about it and they shared their experiences. They had dialogue mm -hmm. that helped them have a better understanding. And look, you can only read the Bible so many times with a single approach. Right. But you can read it an infinite and eternal amount of time on the an innumerable yeah. amount of time. If you're looking for the inspired word of God in mm -hmm. that story. And then I always ask myself the question, look, there's a reason I was drawn to this story or that story or this passage. And it's great. I'm going to read it as if I've never read it before. And sometimes that means having someone read it to me. Mm -hmm. Or reading it into a tape recorder or a voice recorder and listening back to it. Do it differently than you've done it before. And then sit with it. Mm -hmm. And then ask this question. So what? What does this mean to me? Mm -hmm. And then shut up and listen. Yeah. So often we ask God for guidance. 
And then we don't shut up long enough to hear the response. Yeah. That's been my challenge is mm -hmm. I will pray a prayer, a petition ad nauseum. Mm -hmm. But if I would just take a breath, the answers that I'm looking for are in front of me. Mm -hmm. They are part of my experience where the question wouldn't be coming up. Right. Yeah. So it's finding that difference. Again, it's not a crisis of faith. Mm -hmm. We're not looking for human perfection. It's a crisis of belief, which is an invitation to dig deeper in our relationship with God. Mm -hmm. To explore further, to look with fresh eyes, to look for the inspiration and not be committed to a belief that we're not experiencing. Otherwise, there'd be no crisis. Right. And we don't understand the impact that it has for us. For sure. Yeah. And you've touched on this idea of prayer and asking for answers a couple of times in my view on it, and again, open to hearing your thoughts too, but a lot of the times I think people don't listen because the answer you receive is not the what the one you want, it's the one you need, right? And I've had to really, and again, that comes with a level of acceptance that, okay, how committed am I to this? So, so that's the other part of prayer that I don't think people, at least based on my experience, fully appreciate is, okay, I can ask, but am I really willing to receive? Because mm -hmm. what I'm going to receive is not always going to be what I want. And that's been a lot of the times. And there's a level of humility that goes into it. And I would, some people may even call it blind faith in a way. And, and I think that's faith to me in general is having this level of acceptance that, okay, I don't know how all of this is going to shape out. So... I need to lean into it and trust that this is the right course of action, even though it's not the answer I wanted. And there's perhaps a, a level of growth involved here. And, you know, every time I've looked back in hindsight, that's been the case, whether or not I see it all the time. So, so there's that piece there. The other piece, as you were touching on the Old Testament, and I wrote a piece a couple of days ago on sin. I just really fascinated lately around the topic of sin because I see people have so much shame that comes up within it. And majority of the time, I feel that shame is projected outwards. And often that shame is shown, it shows up as perfectionism or blame towards others. And I think what I've come to realize in general is the idea of sin is also misunderstood. If you look at it from the, the word is actually from ancient Greek uh, around archery, it's to miss the mark, right? So when I think about it that way, it's okay, what do I do when I'm playing basketball and I miss a shot? Do I just beat myself up? Sometimes I do. Or do I go back and replay that moment in my head and go practice over and over again so the next time I'm in a better position to hit it. And it may not happen, right? But it requires me to keep trying and not give up. So anytime in life we miss the mark, we need to have that same view, right? And then the other piece you were talking about was religious texts. And I, I agree with you. What I've come to realize is a lot of the narratives and the stories, if you look at it, for me, as I reflected back, majority of those stories have applied to different phases of my life. And that's where I see the beauty in it is you can find that I can find a part of me in that story and look at all the experiences and lessons that it can actually implement in my life. And that's the beauty of it. But you have to sit there with an open mind and heart. You can't go in with preconceived notions or judgments or borrowed beliefs, as you said, because then you won't be able to fully internalize or receive the message of the story. And that's the same idea when you're trying to recalibrate your aim after you've committed sin or whatever, you've missed the mark. So I just wanted to tie all that together, but also get your thoughts. 
No, I love that idea. And I've heard that definition before, mm-hmm. the sin from a human perspective is it's missing the mark. Mm-hmm. And a thought on that actually helped me in my day-to-day type A personality is I used to be a goal setter. Mm-hmm. And I grew up in a household where it, it, it was very black and white, pass or fail. There was no gray areas. Right. And so for me, that idea of goal setting, I began to transition into the idea of setting targets. Because when you think about a target, you may have a bullseye, which might be the ultimate quote unquote goal, but mm-hmm. there are rings around that bullseye that are still, there's still, you still get points and they mm-hmm. may double your points or there's different components. If you're looking at a bullseye in archery or darts or whatever, there, there it's a, it's not a hit or miss. It's not a black or white. It's not a right or wrong. And so I began just in my own personal life to begin talking about Mm -hmm. setting targets. And what that did was that helped my perfectionism Mm -hmm. take a back seat. But I also came back to this idea. I want to come back to the idea of the definition of sin and something we talked about earlier in our conversation today and the idea of oneness. And for me, in working through, not unlike you, spending time thinking about what, what is sin? Man, we give it a lot of power, both internally and projected. And as you said, and how we internalize the idea of sin really is reflected in the way we project ourselves to others, our worth, our value, our presence, our willingness to show up or not, Mm -hmm. is that for me, if I take sin back to this idea of oneness, the idea of sin The definition of sin for me is simply the idea that I could possibly be separate from God, that I could do something that is not of God because I'm God's expression. Right. Or how skilled am I at being God's expression? And if I'm doing something that is not of God, that means I'm seeing myself as separate from God. And that's not true. That's simply not true. And that takes us back real quick to something you talked about earlier in the idea of of things being true for us. And we talk about seeking truth. And I'm going to use a little bit of grammar here for just a second, just for the example, is when we talk about something being true, we must be careful not to mistake something being true or something being the truth, capital T, unchangeable, immutable, Mm -hmm. absolutely consistent. Mm -hmm. Now I'm where I'm sitting. It is 953 AM where your listeners are sitting, where you, where you're sitting right now, forget your listeners because they're not listening live, Mm -hmm. but it's 953 for me. What time is it for you in your world? 953. Oh, shoot. That wasn't a good example. <laughs> if I was talking to somebody in Jersey City, yeah. it'd be 1153. Yeah. And that would be true for them. No less true for them than it is true mm-hmm. that it's 953 for me. What that, okay, that can be true. So when we're talking about the differences of opinion, we have to be careful not to equate that to truth, capital mm-hmm. T, that mm-hmm. comes from the divine. Because Truth would tell us, when we look at our spiritual text, our scriptural text, that tell us there is no such thing as time or space mm-hmm. in the divine unfoldment. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So it's so important that we know the perspective with which we are defining a word. And sin, for me, again, is this, the, the very idea that I could be separate from God. And that then leads to things like maybe telling a fib or Mm -hmm. not being kind to the customer service rep that's not being very helpful to me in this moment. All of those things that we call sin, they disappear from our experience the moment we go back and realize our oneness with divine mind. Absolutely. Yeah, and that goes back to, again, that dichotomy we talked about around perfection and, and flawed. 
and having that level of acceptance for sure. And it's skill level. It's that skill level again of understanding what is the definition of perfection from a spiritual Mm -hmm. perspective is very different than the definition from the human Mm -hmm. perspective. And is our skill level in discernment in seeking truth as that skill level increases, the chasm falls away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. And that's why they say the truth will set you free. That's right. uh, (laughs) Now, the last piece I did want to explore with you, or maybe not the last one, but there's more. So you talked about even working with people that have been incarcerated. And I've, again, been fascinated with, with this idea of often individuals that go into solitary confinement and just come out completely transformed. There's some, you know, obviously I've read about Malcolm X, I've read about, uh, and then there's some other examples as well. But in their stories, there, there's, again, this, and, and we've touched on truth, and they just are able to find their truth, quote unquote, and have this conviction and come out transformed. So when you're working with people, what is allowing them to go through that transformation? And what is about solitary confinement? Like for me, what I've been able to understand is what there's different layers of it. There's the the physical and the metaphysical, but in the physical realm, you're obviously you're cut away from the world and none of those distractions are there. You really have no choice but to sit with yourself. And then in the metaphysical, I think through that sitting with yourself, you're probably able to make this connection. That's why when I'm able to seek out solitude for myself, it's the most, I would say, the best thing I can do for myself in those moments because I'm able to have this deeper sense of connection. But that's just me. I just want to get your thoughts with respect to that as well. And I think this would tie into the whole notion of self-love that we really wanted to talk about too, but (laughs) haven't had the opportunity to touch on yet. Right. I think it's really important that we understand the difference between you and I in, in our worlds seeking out solitude versus an individual who is incarcerated being placed in solitary confinement. The impetus is often very different. Yes. And for us, it's choice. For them, it rarely is a choice. Mm -hmm. Unless they're saying, I'm going to commit one act or another because I know I'll wind up in solitary. Right. And then that's that's an entirely different conversation in and of itself. Yeah, but I think there's this idea of reframing. So again, we've touched on it looking at this is happening for me. So can I reframe this? So sorry. Yeah. But no, yeah, no, that's exactly where I was going. It's that space of being able to say, and I think that it's a gift for Mm -hmm. you think of the Nelson Mandela's, the Malcolm X, the Mm Gandhi's is it's the reframing and not seeing it as a punishment that's being impressed upon them, Mm -hmm. but actually an invitation because If you think about it for just a moment, take out the physical aspects of being in solitary confinement in a prison and compare that to a monastery where all outside influence is essentially deafened. It's muted. It's gone. It's eliminated. It's removed. And so you've got this opportunity to really sit with yourself to sit Mm -hmm. with your questions. And this is where we're saying, what lens are we looking at those questions through? The physical question or the metaphysical question? Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's the, when we, when I, in working with those individuals who've been incarcerated and the, the minimum sentence for me to work with an individual is they have already been incarcerated for 20 years. That's the minimum. They've seen it all you, when, when you really think about what their experience has been. And I have had individuals I'm working with that have experienced that solitary confinement, and they will tell you that it is maddening. And here's the difference between insanity mm-hmm. and spiritual madness. 
-hmm. is insanity says there are no answers. There's no reason for this. I can't change it. It's being done to me. And to me, spiritual me, spiritual madness mm -hmm. is the juxtaposition of that from the metaphysical realm. And mm -hmm. spiritual madness says, this is happening for me. But for it to happen for me, I have to understand who I am. Mm -hmm. And that's the value of the length of a solitary confinement or for mm -hmm. us on the outside looking for solitude. Yeah. Look, sometimes 10 minutes of solitude is all you need, especially if you've got kids and pets and spouses and jobs and all the et ceteras that go with it. Five minutes may be the best you can do. Mm -hmm. But the reality of it is it's the approach that we take in that space. And some people have, they have those God whispers, those angel messages in that space of solitary confinement when they are imprisoned, which then gives them the path to begin the questioning. But what happens is that we, when we are in solitary, we are sitting in the unknown. Mm -hmm. We're sitting in the mystery of the world. We can't control anything. We don't know what's going on. We have no control over the outcome. So the human picture begins to fall away. And when you think about different faith backgrounds, for example, a Orthodox Jew will not say the word God. Mm. And it's not out of any disrespect. It's actually meant out of a belief that we could never know the allness of God, that the mystery of God, the Bible tells us that God goes by many names. And yet when we are faced with sitting in the mystery sitting in the unknown, it scares the bejesus out of us. Yes. <laughs> from a human perspective. Yeah. But from a medical, metaphysical perspective, that's the invitation to see we are not in control, but we can be in command, to see that we are one with God and that we get to work on our skill level of how we express that. And as you said, I love this word that keeps coming up in our conversation today of reframing because the circumstances don't change. Right. It's just, look, yeah, any monk can meditate. It's quiet. The distractions are physically removed from the experience. You want to consider yourself a good meditator, a successful meditator, go to the mall on Christmas Eve and sit in the middle aisle and med commit to your meditation practice. And if you can find that sense of peace on Christmas Eve in the middle of the mall, then what you've done is, is you have now removed the physical perspective, the physical components, the physical elements. And that's what prayer and meditation is really meant for us to be. If we believe that God is all knowing, I don't need to take my prayers of petition to God. God already knows where I'm struggling, what I feel like I need help with, what wish I would have, what blessing I would wish for another. God doesn't need me to tell those ideas. But if I can find that place of sitting in the mystery, sitting in the unknown, then it comes back to something else we've talked about this morning. And that's the receiving without an expectation of what it looks like or sounds or feels. Like. Yes. When you go into meditation or prayer with a question and you get the most left-handed answer, our aim, our directive, our purpose is to follow that left-handed answer. Mm -hmm. And yet what we will often do is find 500 different ways to take that question into prayer with us. Yeah. Because we, didn't, we don't like the answers we're getting. Mm -hmm. So... Stop with the questions. For me, the most important question that I take into prayer is, all right, God, I'm here. What do I need to know today? What do I need to know in this moment that I'm not seeing clearly? Mm -hmm. And so often the ideas that come are completely unrelated on the surface to whatever challenge might have taken me to prayer that day. But very impactful in my life overall, 
because it's the mystery unfolding in my experience. It's not human rationale, it's divine order. Mm -hmm. And we expect divine order, we, we expect human order to look, I'm saying it backwards, we expect divine order to look like human order and mm -hmm. it just doesn't. Yeah. We're gonna be disappointed every time. I agree. So I think everything we've talked about to this point I know, like I said earlier, we wanted to talk about self-love, but we have in a way, because ultimately that's this journey, right? It is what I've come to realize is if I can't give it to myself, the love, then I'm not in a position to give it to others. And through this exploration and deeper connection and seeking solitude, I've been able to, and, and we've talked about seeing that perfection and accepting the the flaws and being able to receive those are all forms of self-love and when you and i had chatted before we had talked about how do you make the self-love piece practical and without framing it that way we've actually talked about it all along and that's the practicality piece of it and when we started the recording today, I talked about this whole notion of self-love being trendy, but it's always been there from yeah. the beginning of time, right? And we've just come to call it different things. And we've touched on the whole idea of religious trauma. So people will do away with religion or faith, um, but then they'll want the more secular version of self-love but ultimately it's being able to accept yourself. And that's what I've come to realize, but I also want to get your thoughts here as we bring it all to a close and tie it together. Sure. No, I, I'm a big proponent of forget the how to, mm -hmm. let's talk about the how do I. Mm -hmm. And so here's a real practical activity that we can do. You and I, your listeners, each of us have the capability of doing this. And this is all about self-love. Mm -hmm. is take the golden rule, which is universal across all spiritual texts. It's present in every spiritual walk, regardless of faith background. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And that mm -hmm. sounds really fantastic on the surface. Mm -hmm. Ask yourself the question, how do I think of myself? Because if I'm going to treat others as I would have them treat me, if I don't think I'm worthy of being treated well, then I actually am giving permission to people to treat me with a lack of kindness, with a lack of love. And that sounds really selfish. I'm not talking about being arrogant or being self-centered or being egotistical. I'm talking about the idea of loving ourselves exactly where we're at and saying, yes, I have these human flaws in the same space that I am divinely, perfectly, completely created by God. Mm -hmm. And so am I treating myself the way I would have others treat me? Forget, mm -hmm. am I treating others the way I would want them to treat me? But it's that space of, I think in our society today, we actually do the golden rule pretty well. Yeah. But what we misunderstand is that we don't think highly enough of ourselves or we don't think of ourselves in the proper light. And so we allow for the behaviors and the way people treat us to continue mm -hmm. because we don't think of ourselves as worthy or valued enough to be treated differently. Yes, and so when we think about this idea of self-love, for me, that goes back to that practical activity of saying, okay, let's take it to the golden rule. Mm -hmm. Am I, do I love, is the love that I have for myself? And love for yourself isn't excusing and condoning bad behavior. It's a very authentic, realistic look at who and what we are. Mm -hmm. But is the example of how I love and care for myself does it give permission? What permission does it give to everyone else to how I look to be treated? 
And so that idea of self-love comes back to oneness, the target, missing the Mm -hmm. target. It it encompasses reframing this Mm -hmm. idea of sin being black and white versus being a target where, look, there's a myriad of different ways that we different skill levels even Mm -hmm. we can live out of, but we have to be willing to ask the hard questions, sit in the solitude and the quiet in the mystery and the unknown, and then to receive the answers that are coming regardless of whether they feel good or not, Mm -hmm. because that self-love starts in that place of, how I view what God has given to me in my Mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. And if I'm constantly denigrating it, one, it dishonors our creator. And two, it is the perfect example of how I would allow people to treat me, even though it's different than how I would treat others. But there's also that separation then in how I'm treating others That's from a very egoic place. Mm -hmm. If I'm doing it for the accolade or the acknowledgement or a sense of being a a good doer, (laughs) do-gooder. So it's foundational that we understand that self-love is about acceptance. And acceptance is not condoning bad behavior, but it's about living authentically and saying, in this area of my life, I'm not very skilled and I've got some work to do and I've got some questions to ask and some Mm -hmm. mystery to sit in. And I'm going to be better at this over here and that's okay. We're Mm going to be different in that self-love across the board. But if at the foundation, at the very root of who we are, we can allow for ourselves exactly where we're at because we can't change what we don't acknowledge. Mm -hmm. So when we begin to talk about this idea of change and transformation, if I can't acknowledge where I'm at and lovingly do, then the change, the transformation that I'm looking for will never be mine Mm -hmm. because the motive and the intent and the desire is egoic versus metaphysical and spiritual. Absolutely. Yeah. That's my two cents. (laughs) No, I agree. I think you you touched on the whole idea of fulfillment and i think that separation is what prevents that fulfillment and that's just my view but so much and i'll take the <laughs> i'll call you babs because i know you said that's <laughs> what your friends and loved ones call you i'll just go ahead with that Welcome but to uh, the family <laughs> yeah appreciate that thank you so much for this conversation is i really enjoyed it and time just flew by and like you said we can keep going, but do have to bring it to a close, unfortunately. And for listeners that want to find your work or find you online, what are some ways they can do that? I'll make it real easy because I'm sure you've got show notes that are going to go yes. with the podcast episode. Absolutely. Everything is just my full name, Amy Lynn Carroll, whether it's Instagram or Facebook. My website is all Amy Lynn Carroll. Um, I welcome dialogue. Matter of fact, I actually have a widget on my website where you can call and leave me a message Mm -hmm. and I can reach back to you. We don't have to do things via email and those kind of things, but whether it's Instagram or Facebook, my website, I look forward to having conversations of consequence with Mm -hmm. individuals and listening and being present for you so that you can learn how to be present for yourself Mm -hmm. and others. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Uh, I will put all of that in the show notes. People can find you then. I'll look forward to it. Thank you for the conversation, the easy conversation today. (laughs) Yes, yes, absolutely.